What is a framework in regards to the web, and why do you care? Because I told you to. Go ahead. Um, it's a uh, group of programs that pull on a technological link between um, sort of like a methodology in your code so that you can debug and um, clean up and make sure everything is working correctly. That's part of it. it. A framework, like she said, is really it's a group of uh, programming languages set up and working together for you, usually a combination of JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and sometimes PHP. And sometimes they use other programming languages. Anybody else find anything else out about a framework? They contain like, the parameters for CSS and tools that um, developers use. Yeah. 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 They're really a way to make things faster and easier for developers. So, let's see if I can show you something here. Okay, this is a popular one. It's an open source web framework that is optimi optimized for programmer happiness and sustainable productivity. It lets you write beautiful code by favoring convention over configuration. Um, really what, this is probably one of the most popular frameworks, there's lots of them out there. Um, and so you can look at this. If you want, if anybody needs extra credit, downloading a framework and doing a page in it would be worth, we'll, and I'll take that on a case by case basis, you'll either get points or you'll get absences erased, your choice. So it would be equivalent of two days work or 20, two days that you've missed or 20 points, whichever you need. So if anybody's interested in playing with a framework, this is something that you could do for extra credit. Oh, excellent, see if you can get sound first. Yeah, I'm trying to play um, a YouTube video and I can't get any sound. So take a quick look. What other frameworks are out there? Bootstrap. That's a very popular one. That was Bootstrap. Anybody find any other? With the work that you've done with Dreamweaver, can you see why Dreamweaver, um, why people are trying to move towards more automated things like WordPress and um, development environments like this, web frameworks? Because one of the things that you can do here with a web framework is you can get something that is a responsive design and just start plugging stuff in. So really what it's doing is it's saving you the trouble of reinventing the interface. You can make modification to it. It's not exactly like a content management system, but it has a lot of the same benefits of automatically rescaling for you. Do we have sound now? Excellent. What was wrong with it? Your Ah, okay. Usually I've just got a knob on the wall. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so that's frameworks, and if you need extra credit to make up for either excessive absences or some extra points, or you just want to do it because it's fun, take a look at one, download it, and create a page in it, and then be prepared to present and talk about it for five minutes. Show us the page and what you did. Um, you actually, your final projects, I actually want to be finished for next Thursday. You've been working in WordPress for a while, you should be in pretty good shape on that, yes? You had lots of lab time last week. Um, if you've done Tuesday, that would be awesome. So for extra credit next week, you can bring a friend to class to test web pages. So I'm going to go over, we're going to watch a 20 minute video on how to test a web page so you can see how the process is going to go. And then we're going to um, work on what you want your website tested for. And you're going to pick like five scenarios which will make sense after you see the video. We'll talk about what I want for next week. So you're going to have your web page should be pretty much done and you should have objectives that people can test. Like if they want to find out what degree you have, how would they do it? That's what I'm looking for for a scenario and we'll go over that more after the video.
Okay. The neighborhood's drop down that he wasn't specific enough. Any others? Anything else? Rates were, were not consistent. Yeah, th that's a big one. Anything else? The FAQs were not um, detailed enough. Anything else? And anything else? I think that goes into the page being too busy as well. It feeds into that. Can you see the value in watching somebody else use the site? Because if you're a designer, you always know what you meant to do. It's very hard to proofread your own work in this way. I mean, it's good to do it, but you don't know where people are going to trip up. Even if you don't do official testing, having a scenario and having other people um, attempt to do things on your site and having them talk out loud while they do it is incredibly beneficial. How many people do you think you need to find, how many people do you think you need to have test your site to find 80% of the problems? Five. Yeah, five people. That's enough. They'll, they'll find all, and they'll find all the big ones. So how soon should you start testing? At the wireframe level. Where would you do this? Where would you do that? Just run it by one person and just ask them how they'd do something and see if they'd do it the way you plan on it. You can't test too early. Um, the earlier you're in the process you test, the easier it is to fix something. F fixing something at the wireframe level before you ever create the site, cheap and easy. After the site's been published, expensive and hard. So you want to test early so you can fix problems early. Now let's see what he says. And you guys got a lot of the same ones. He'll also show you some simple fixes. A serious usability problem. <coughs> Try to pick the three you'd most want to fix if it was your site. Pause the video for a minute to make your list. When you're done, start it up again, and I'll give you my list. Here are the three problems I saw that I think it was most important to fix. The user had no problem figuring out the basic idea of the extra value plan, that you get lower rates if you make a monthly commitment. But she was completely stumped by the phrase, rates shown for EVP $50, and she didn't realize that it meant that there was more than one plan. The user didn't feel like she got a satisfying answer about whether she'd always be able to get a car when she wanted one. In her words, it says it's always going to be available. My sense is that I'd like something much more specific, that it might not be available. Near the end of the session, the user was surprised to see that the car available in her neighborhood would cost her more than she thought it would, based on what she'd seen on the rates page. She even said that this might make her distrust the whole site and leave. The rates page actually does use the word from to indicate that the prices shown are minimums. The from is on the left side of the column and the prices are on the right. Those are the three that struck me as most important, but there were certainly others that you might have had on your list. For instance, this user didn't notice the extra value plans until I prompted her. This didn't make my top three list though because I suspect that if I'd let her continue a little longer, she would have noticed them on her own. In an actual test, I probably would have prompted her as soon as I did, but I wanted to keep the demo short. You might have thought that it was a problem that it took her so long to find the answer to the question about availability. I did too, but 
I wouldn't consider it one of the most serious problems because she did find the information more or less where she expected to, even if it did take her longer than it probably should have. The user did have to do a lot of math to figure out how much this car would cost her, but I didn't put it on my top three list after watching this particular session because while it might be a problem for some users, it didn't seem to be a problem for her. I'd be watching to see if other participants in the same round of testing had trouble with it though. Whatever you had on your list, don't worry if it was different from mine. The point of this exercise wasn't to come up with definitive answers. It was just to give you a feel for the process of identifying a problem. The only people who can come up with the definitive answers about what should be fixed on a site are the people actually working on that site. While we're at it, I'd like to show you how I've tried fixing two of these problems, just to give you an example of what I mean by doing the least you can do. As I described in the book, I think it's always best to try to find the simplest solution you can for usability problems. To try tweaking first and only turn to redesign if tweaking doesn't do the job. For instance, take the problem the user had with the phrase rates shown for EVP $50. I tried getting rid of the phrase and adding tabs for the four plans instead. That way it's clear that what you're looking at in the right hand panel is the rates for one of the four available plans. Another tweak might solve the problem of the user not realizing that the hourly and daily rates were minimums. Just moving the word from close to the dollar amount would make it hard to miss. Well, that's it. I hope this video has helped convince you that usability testing doesn't have to be complicated to produce a lot of useful insights. Whether you end up reading the book or not, I hope it encourages you to do some testing on your own website. You're also welcome to download the script that I use for testing at rocketsurgerymadeeasy.com. Okay, so that's usability testing. And for your pages for next week, or for your sites, I want you to come up with three to five tasks that you're going to have um, used in your user test. So what, what might a task be? Most of you are doing portfolio pages. Can you give me an example of a task a user might accomplish on your page? Find the resume. Find the resume? Mm -hmm. What else? Mm -hmm. And I'm generally on the resume looking for more specific information than that. I want the resume to be where they find it, but I'm usually looking for find what degree the person has or what her work, his, her, his or her work history is. And for the contacting, you would like to hire the person, how would you contact them? So I'm usually putting it in the case of a scenario. So for homework for next week, Now, for this week, I want you to finish um, I want you to finish section two of Don't Make Me Think, Do Your Mind Maps for that for Thursday. And I'm going to have you hand in your final project progress. And I'm going to be looking for how you're naming things and incorporating search engine optimization. I will go around and look at each person's site today and give you some things to work on. I want to see where you're at with it. So you want to hand in just a link to where you're at with it. And in there, you're also going to have five, and we're going to make it a little shorter because it's three to five scenarios that you want to test on your site. So you'll give me the link to your site and you'll upload a Word file or you can just type it in the comments of things that you want people to test. Okay, now we're going to look at, um, don't make me think, everybody should have read the first five chapters. And of course the first thing I'm going to ask is, what did you think? Since it's telling you not to make them think. So what did you guys think? I asked you to come back with what the most important thing in section one was. So I want each of you to tell me what, you t what was your takeaway as the most important thing in section one. And we'll just start at the back here. What was your, your most important thing in section one?
some clear navigation. Don't, go, don't get the user lost. Ryan, what would you think was the most important thing that you took away from the first section? I'd say organization as well. OK. Josh? Good titles. He liked to call it the road signs. He wanted really clear road signs. Tony? Uh, scannability. Right. And what does, it, what does he mean by scannability? It's a don't put long paragraphs that, I mean, don't put long paragraphs that people have to like read through to understand a page because people aren't reading. They're scanning for information they need. So that's where the head, headings, <laughs> the headings come in. Um, we have really clear headings because and bullet points when necessary so that they can scan it and know where to go for the information they want. Is anybody be finding that since the internet has come around that you change the way that you read? That you skim things more? Now, I don't skim when I'm reading for pleasure, but when I'm reading textbooks and stuff, you get better at skimming because it's really the way we work with the internet. Rose, most important thing for you? Um, organization and as well as having clearly labeled information. Okay. And that was pretty much the theme of the whole first section. Adele? Um, scannability as well um, and organization because when I'm on a website, I don't, I don't want to have to read much. And, that, and we're all that way. You want to get to what you want. Yeah. And sometimes you'll read when you get there, depending on what you're looking for, but you just want to find what you're there for. Right. You want, it's, it, I think what you're basically saying is that it's a low cost to have them click. You, it's okay to have them click multiple times because they don't mind particularly getting the wrong thing and going back. Uh, making things self-evident or at least self-explanatory. Self-evident. If you can't be self-evident, be self-explanatory. That's an excellent. Uh, kind of with the scanning thing, uh, uh, like design like a billboard. Mm -hmm. Since people are going to read it like a billboard, make it a great billboard. Yeah. Sander? Uh, just use obvious language. Use the words that people expect to find. Absolutely. Don't try to be cute or clever. Mike? And Brandon, what was the most important thing to you? Excellent. So I think you guys are getting the main points. I'm going to flip through it real quick and see if there's anything else I wanted you to pick up from here. Um, this is probably my favorite textbook ever. I think you'll find that he writes it in a way that's easy to read. I love some of his phrases. It's not rocket surgery. That is his other book, is Rocket Surgery Made Simple. That's his testing book that we just watched the video from. Okay, so the first law of usability, which is the whole first chapter, is don't make me think. And this comes back down to your points of label things well and be clear. And it went through things that make me think. And how we really use the web. And this, to me, everybody picked up scanning. To me, the most important thing was satisficing. And it's sort of like the old saying, whatever you look for, when you're looking for something, it's always in the last place you look. Now, why is something always in the last place you look? Yeah, because you, unless you're really dumb, you don't keep looking after you find it, right? And that's the way people use the web. They, to me, the biggest thing in here is satisficing. If they get what they need, they quit looking. So there might be something better out there, but if they found something that met their needs, they're not going to find it. And we mostly just muddle through because it's easy to guess. And this is, I like the reality of what we design for and what, how we actually read. And that we're just skimming for the most important things. And I love that he's talking about the um, far side, the ginger the dog. We're looking for phrases that seem to match. OK, 
Okay, again, the whole purpose of chapter three is that you're making great billboards. Conventions are your friends. Um, let's talk about conventions are your friends. One of the things that, uh, that he's really clear on is what you can click on. How do you know if something's a link? Give me three different ways. Tony? Underline. Underline? How else would you know something's a link? Button. Button? How else would you know something's a link? Change the color. You can change the color of it. Anybody else? It turns into the pointing hand. The mouse cursor will change. So those are generally, now the mouse cursor is going to change regardless of your design. If it's a link, the mouse cursor will change. Um, there's some JavaScript things that sometimes you need to make something a link to itself so that you get the pointing hand. When we were working with our JavaScript, remember in the last images site we did, how we did the JavaScript and we'd click on something and make it switch? Um, if you remember, I had you put in a hash mark that makes it link to itself. Because while it would be clickable without that, that's what gives you the pointing hand, is it being a link. That's how you tell it to, to have a pointing hand. So if you're using something with JavaScript and you want it to be a button, just make it a link to itself. That way, it will turn into the pointing hand. And that's a big, and people look for that. But that's going away. Why is the pointing hand becoming less important? Mobile devices, all mouse functions are becoming less important. Okay, this is a clear one. Create important visual hierarchies. And these actually tie into your H1 tags, or your H tags. H1 is the most important thing. How many H1 tags should you have per page? At least one. Sometimes you can have more if you have different sections, like in different articles in a page, you could have a title for each article. Other than that, you can go down to less important than that, but you need at least one H1 tag per page. The other thing that you can do is you can nest things to show that they belong together. And I think we're all doing that with the divs where we put things inside that are grouping pictures together that belong together. Break up your pages and just um, make it obvious that it's clickable. We sort of talked about that. Be well organized, avoid clutter. Highlight key terms. And he says it doesn't matter how many times you click as long as each one brings you closer to where you're supposed to get. If you need assistance, make it brief and timely, not well in advance. And I think this is the most important, probably one of the most important chapters in the book. Why does he cross out needless? Because you don't need it. Omit words. He, and what's his rule of thumb if you write something? What percentage of words should you get rid of? Yeah, and then you should go back and do it again. And I find that having written for the web for a really long time, I find it harder to go back and write in a conventional manner. I do almost everything in outlines and bulleted lists because that's the way you're used to getting information from the web. How many of you are a fan of bulleted lists and would rather read a bulleted list than a paragraph on a website? That would be me, yeah. And that's because we're being trained to just get the information we want. It's changing grammar almost as much as texting is. So this is, he calls it the art of not writing for the web. There's a whole book, uh, Jenny Reddish, um, I think it's called Letting Go of the Words that talks about writing for the web. Happy talk. It used to be um, when we were first doing web design back in the late 90s, you usually had a welcome page to your site. You don't find that much anymore because people are your site for a reason. You're not like welcoming them to your home. They want to see how they can get what they want out of the site. So everything should be there for a purpose. And he's talking about, although happy talk is sometimes found on the home page, usually in paragraphs that start with the words welcome, it's not the only place it shows up. Instructions must die. You want to keep things as simple as possible. So he goes from 103 words to 34 words. 
because this is really all they need to know.